Every once in a while, I get an email from someone who watched my videos on online privacy, and they now want to take their privacy more seriously. Good for them. But a lot of times, people tell me how overwhelming it is once they learn about how extensive online surveillance is. Because the rabbit hole is deep. It's not enough to change your browser and your search engine. You have to change your email. You have to install Linux instead of Windows. You have to delete all your social media. You have to get all your friends to switch to messaging you on Signal. You have to throw away your smartphone or install a de-googled Android ROM. You have to use Tor for everything online. And even if that's not enough, they're still watching you. You have to only use cash, wear a mask everywhere so surveillance cameras can't track you. Is that even enough? Take a deep breath. A lot of people have talked about this feeling of overwhelm that you get whenever you want to protect your privacy. And it's so common that people have come up with a name for it. It's called privacy fatigue. The list of steps you have to take to protect your privacy is endless and they come with some serious downsides. Gone is all the convenience of doing anything digitally, and you have to live like a hermit if you want true internet privacy. But no matter how much you do to mitigate all the data collection about you, you will never be truly private as long as you use the internet. The only way to opt out 100% from the surveillance is to never use the internet and move to a cabin in the woods. But what if you didn't have to do all of that? I've heard a lot of stories about how getting into privacy almost ruined people's lives. One of those stories is my own. I first learned about how much data big tech was collecting about me from watching YouTube videos. I took advice from people that cared about privacy, and at first, it didn't seem that hard. So I started doing simple things like switching my browser from Chrome to Firefox. The problem is, the more research you do, the more you find out that you have to do. I started learning more, and the more I learned, the more paranoid I became. If I don't do everything possible to protect my privacy, I'm still compromised. I just couldn't do everything possible to escape surveillance. I was younger and more broke at the time, and I didn't have the money to pay for a VPN, a private email service, a new phone that I could install a custom ROM on, and a new laptop that I could Libre boot to get around the surveillance and the management engine. I felt defeated. I couldn't beat the evil mass surveillance boogeyman I had created in my mind. I assumed that if I couldn't beat the system, there was no point to what I was doing. Eventually I just gave up and went back to using Google for everything, because it seemed impossible. And my story is not the only story out there. I've heard from others that have similarly gotten interested in privacy, and even gone as far as to cut off friends who they can't message privately. I've gotten emails from students that are increasingly having trouble making relationships with friends because everyone is using social media and they can't. When you're the only person in your world that cares about privacy, it can get pretty lonely. But I don't think that caring about privacy should come at the cost of your life, your relationships, or your sanity. One of the most important things that a lot of people skip over with privacy is determining your threat model, or the level of privacy you need. Who are you protecting your personal data from exactly? I've talked about this before, but I really want to go more in-depth in this video, because getting this right is the difference between you losing your sanity or not. Now, this channel has always been primarily about protecting your data from big tech and broad government surveillance. Big data is constantly collecting data about everyone. And it can be used for things like giving you more targeted ads, as well as things that are much more personal, like affecting your insurance rates because your medical history was sold. Since the government also has their hands in every big tech company, lots of law-abiding citizens also don't want the government to have a complete history of everything they've ever done, including things that might become illegal in the future. So on this channel, that's what I'm mainly concerned with. I teach about how to mitigate this kind of data collection as much as possible. Instead of sharing everything with Google, we want to minimize the data that they have about us. But you have to think about your own needs. Maybe you're not really concerned about keeping your data private from big tech, you just want to keep it safe from hackers. Or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum, and you're criticizing your government in a place where it's dangerous to do so, and you need to have a higher level of privacy, or you're literally going to prison. But people don't understand this. They talk about the solutions to the problem before establishing what the problem you're trying to solve even is. To borrow some terminology from the world of OPSEC, or Operation Security, most people talk about the countermeasures first, instead of the threats they're protecting against. Now, a countermeasure is just a response to a threat. So, an example might be, if you're concerned about the threat of big data using browser fingerprinting against you, you might use a browser that can evade fingerprinting, like the Mulvad browser. So, the Mulvad browser is a countermeasure to fingerprinting. But, if protecting against fingerprinting is not something you care about, why are you taking advice from people who do care about that? But, if you just want to be super private and anonymous online, you might think to protect yourself against every threat, just to be safe. But it comes at a high cost. It comes at the cost of convenience and your time. And the worst part is, you might be wasting time and effort protecting against an imaginary threat. 
Let me give another example. It's like saying that putting a lock on your front door makes you more secure. So putting a lock on every door in your house must make you even more secure, right? Sure, I guess it technically would slow down an intruder, but I don't know anyone that wants to go through the inconvenience of pulling out a ring of keys every time you go into a different room, just to make yourself a tiny bit more secure. At the same time, it probably is a good idea to have a lock on every door in a bank. But they have a different threat model than you do. Just because it's the right level of security for them, doesn't mean it is for you. In the privacy world, people love to read or watch privacy tutorials and recommendations that talk about all of the solutions without asking what the problem is that they're trying to protect against. Let's be honest, I know you clicked on a video before called something like how to be private and anonymous online with a picture of a guy in a dark hoodie. But when you watch a video like this, you immediately get overwhelmed with how many steps there are, right? And they're always talking about how you can keep your data safe from them, whoever they are. When you watch a video like that without any context, you're again thinking about the countermeasures before you think about the threats. As another example, you might hear that a good countermeasure against online tracking is Tor. And you're right in a way, because Tor is a very good tool for high threat models against specific threats. But then people fundamentally misunderstand the purpose of the tool, and they start doing weird things like trying to use Tor on a strictest setting for everything. Or you hear some wild things like people trying to use Tor to log into their Facebook or their bank account. They've gotten extremely confused, all because they didn't take the time to originally establish the level of privacy they need. Tor is a tool for being anonymous online, so how does it make any sense logging into your personal account tied to your real world identity using Tor? It doesn't, but that's what happens when people misunderstand all of this. People try to protect themselves from everything, without understanding what that entails. But there's no such thing as having 100% privacy or anonymity online. It's just not possible to defend yourself against every possible threat, and if you wanted to try, you would basically have to give up using the internet. Given the fact that you're still watching this video, I'm going to assume that you don't want that. So I want you to think about what specific threats you actually want to protect yourself from. If you want to protect yourself from the government, is the government actively trying to track you down? If yes, then good luck. But if not, you're probably just concerned about blanket government surveillance. You also have to think about how concerned you are compared to other threats. For example, I care more about not being tracked by big tech than I do about government surveillance. Don't get me wrong, it's important, but it's not my number one priority. That's why I don't wear this goofy mask every time I go outside to protect against surveillance cameras. Sure, some people actually do need to worry about surveillance cameras, and you know what? More power to them. But it's just not something I'm concerned with. Because you also have to ask, how much convenience are you willing to give up? Because if you want to go full schizo, you have to replace everything in your life and possibly give up all your friendships. I'm going to assume you don't want that either, so you have to compromise. So before you start on this whole privacy journey, you need to figure out what you want first, or you're going to be headed in the complete wrong direction. Let's talk more about compromises. It's okay to use some tools that others wouldn't. You have to determine what's right for you, and you can't just blindly follow everyone else. As an example, I even have a Facebook account. Wow, what a hypocrite. Every privacy talking head on the internet says you should delete your Facebook. But I only use my Facebook for Facebook Marketplace. I use it to buy things secondhand because it's the only place that people post secondhand listings online where I live. I put as little information as necessary and don't use my real email address or even my full name. And I only rarely use it. And maybe for you, having a Facebook account is worth it if it's the only way for you to keep in touch with your friends and family. Of course, I recommend using it differently than most people. I would say use it as little as possible and don't put much personal information on it. But you definitely can use something like Facebook while still caring about privacy. Maybe you can make a few adjustments. Instead of having long conversations over Facebook Messenger, you can use it as a tool to schedule meeting people in real life where your conversation won't be mined by ad tech. But there's no one-size-fits-all profile when it comes to privacy. Maybe what works for me won't work at all for someone else who would prefer to never touch a Facebook product ever again. And that's fine. I'm also not saying to just give up the fight for privacy. By all means, if you can convince your friends and family to switch to Signal, go for it. But you don't have to do everything all at once. And yes, you are able to make some compromises and still have a level of privacy. But you're still able to have privacy in other areas of your life. It's not the end of the world. There are people who will gatekeep privacy by saying you're not private online if you do X, Y, and Z. But you don't need to listen to them. Sure, you can always improve it, but going through every step in the YouTube video with the dark hoodie guy is not for everyone. 
because privacy is an incremental process. I've touched on this before, but people think that online privacy is a binary black or white thing, that you're either private online or you're not. But that's not how it works. It's a staircase of small steps you can take. And the more you take, the more you'll be above the surveillance. By all means, educate yourself about online privacy so you can take steps to improve it. Knowledge is key. But the goal is to minimize data collected about you. Scaring yourself by watching videos about how you need to take all these steps or you won't have any privacy doesn't actually help anyone. Instead, it immobilizes you and prevents a lot of people from taking any action. Like I mentioned before, that's what happened to me. The privacy fatigue got to me and I just got overwhelmed and paranoid the more I learned. I had all the knowledge, but I ended up giving up and completely stopped caring about privacy for a while. Just thinking about it stressed me out, so I just didn't think about it. And the only reason I started caring about online privacy again is because I took this more holistic approach to it, and I think it's the path that you should take as well. Maybe you can't replace your Android phone with a privacy phone or a phone that you can install a custom Android ROM on because you can't afford it right now. But you can still take other steps. Use it less often. Leave it at home sometimes when you go out. Do more things in your computer than on your phone. Install privacy-respecting apps using the F-Droid store. There's a lot of small improvements you can take without throwing your hands up and saying you have no privacy if you have a phone. That's what a lot of people say, and it does nothing but inspire inaction in others. So if you want to care about online privacy without going insane, start by determining what level of privacy you really need. Too many people learn about online surveillance and suddenly think that they have to be a secret agent using Tor and all that. Look, it's a useful tool for some, but probably not for most of the people watching this video who are just concerned with big tech collecting data about you. So I'm here to tell you that you can be a normal, well-adjusted person and still care about privacy. You can still have friends and communicate in ways other than carrier pigeons. You can still participate in society, just maybe not constantly on your phone like some people. And just because you care about privacy doesn't mean you need to fall into the extreme paranoia that comes with not having an understanding of what you're protecting yourself from. Figure out what you want to protect yourself from and how much convenience you're willing to give up, and then start implementing solutions. Now if you need me, I'll be in my cabin in the middle of the woods writing my manifesto. If you want to see more videos about privacy like this, please consider supporting the channel using the link in the description or by becoming a channel member. Even just $3 a month really helps me to dedicate more time to making videos like these.